So happy Sunday to uh, our Central and Flat Rock United Methodist Churches on this Sunday as we celebrate the amazing life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'd like to share a passage from his book, Stride Toward Freedom. Dr. King at that time was at his kitchen table and uh, he experienced this epiphany during that time. The Reverend Dr. King was ready to give up and so he wrote in his book, With my cup of coffee sitting untouched before me, I tried to think of a way to move out of the picture without appearing a coward. In this state of exhaustion when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God at midnight are still vivid in my memory. Dr. King wrote, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking to me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I can't face it alone. And so at that moment, Dr. King wrote, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced God before. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears began to go, my uncertainty disappeared, and I was ready to face anything. Dr. King at his kitchen room table had an epiphany, an awakening, a turning point, a defining moment where he reached a point of clarity. And so he continued on with the struggle for the civil rights movement of the 1960s because he knew and he knows that God was with him, around him, and the power within him. Good morning and happy Sunday to everyone. I hope that you are doing well, that you are blessed on this uh, third Sunday of Epiphany. So our text this morning is taken from the Gospel of Apostle John, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. It's about the story about the recruitment of Nathaniel to become a disciple of Jesus. And when Jesus called Nathaniel um, and Philip, Nathaniel was kind of a skeptic and he asked the question, well, can anything good come from Nazareth? And I think that question is a very appropriate question because Nazareth or Israel in general came from the uh, name of Jacob, which has been a namesake of Jacob when he was named Israel, who, who is a habitual liar. You know, he deceived his brother and he deceived everybody else and he walked this earth and lived his life telling lies and deceiving people. And so Nathaniel, I guess, is raising a very important question that is even important to our context. This, during these hard times that we're going through. So in the light of the events that happened in Washington, D.C. the other week at the National Capitol, I think it's about right 
together with Nathaniel, we can also ask the question, can anything good come out of this nation? Can anything good come out of our churches, specifically the United Methodist Church? Can anything good come out from our lives? And so Nathaniel came from Nazareth, which is, of course, is a backwater community drowning in poverty and under the occupation of the Roman Empire under the life had gotten so hard and so bad where there's an outpouring of hate and marginalization of people and oppressive rule and a lot of injustices going on during that time. And so the question of Nathaniel, can anything good come out of all of the difficulties? Can anything good come out of that? And so he was raising a very honest, straightforward, sincere, coming from his heart. And I believe that when God calls us, that calling should always start from being able to get a hold of the truth and being able to ask the truthful questions. It's about truth telling and our capability to engage the truth and the work that God is calling us to do. And so in the light of the event that happened in Washington DC where armed Americans laid siege on the Capitol trying to replace the rule of law with the rule of mob and uh, Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church is one in agreement that it was really a very difficult and sad day, a shameful day in the life of America. So what does God think about all of that that happened in this country how does God heal a broken nation I think is a very appropriate question and I agree 100% what this nation needs is a national healing that this nation needs healing and we know that in the Bible God's nature is about healing God is a God of healing God heals all the hurts, God heals brokenness, God heals conflicts, and God heals a broken nation as well. So there's nothing or there's no area in our lives that God could not heal and transform to make it right. This is the nature of the God of the Bible. But how does God heal a broken nation? And so um, Bob is putting that up right now. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verses, verse 14, I mean. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land so that is how God heals a broken nation is God asked us to first humbly confess and repent of our sins and pray and ask for forgiveness there is a need to get a hold of the truth of our sins and confess the problem confess the wrong that we did and uh, the emperor in the folktale story that I will tell later is uh, about a vain emperor emperor and his new clothes so take a look at this the emperor's new clothes once upon a time, there was a vain emperor who loved clothes. He made sure he always looked splendid all the time and had a different outfit for every day of the year. One day, 
two strangers came to town, stating they were weavers and that they could manufacture the finest clothing that could ever be imagined. The word spread quickly and came to the emperor's ears. If they can truly make wonderful clothes, I want to meet them, the emperor said. And so the emperor's footman arranged a meeting with the two strangers. A little round man and a long thin man arrived at the palace, and they bowed before the emperor. Slimus and slick at your service, your highness, they said. I hear you make wonderful clothes. Is it true, the emperor asked. Oh, yes, not only wonderful clothes, but magical clothes, your majesty, Slimus said. Only clever people can see them. Stupid people can't. I have no magical clothes, the emperor thought. I need to have them. Are the clothes splendid, the emperor asked. Oh, very splendid, your highness, Slick replied, but very expensive, as you can well imagine. Take all the gold you want, cried the emperor. Just make me those clothes. One week later, Slimus and Slick returned to the palace to show the emperor the clothes they had made. Here are your beautiful clothes, your majesty. Don't they look splendid? The emperor and all his footmen gulped because they couldn't see a thing. None of them wanted to seem stupid. So when the emperor said, Splendid! They are splendid! All his footmen agreed. Oh, yes, your majesty. These are by far your most splendid clothes. The emperor decided to wear his magical clothes to the royal procession that very day. Here is your cloak, said Slimus. It's as light as a feather. Oh, your highness, your clothes fit you so well, added Slick. The emperor admired himself in the mirror. Don't I look magnificent? People will talk about me for years to come. Yes, your majesty, everyone agreed, staring at the emperor. Open the palace gates, ordered the emperor, and let the royal procession begin. The crowd gasped when they saw the emperor. Everyone had heard that only clever people could see his clothes, so everyone cried out, How splendid his majesty looks in his new clothes, and look how well they fit. Of course, no one could see the clothes, but none of them would admit that, because no one wanted to declare himself a fool, until a small child cried out, The emperor has no clothes on. Then Everyone looked at each other and began laughing out loud. <laughs> the emperor has no clothes on. The emperor realized he had been fooled by Slick and Slimus and that he was indeed naked. He blushed bright red, but thought it was better to continue the procession under the illusion that anyone who couldn't see his clothes was a fool. He walked stiffly while behind him a page held his imaginary mantle. As for Slick and Slimus, they had disappeared with all of the gold, never to be seen again. But at least one thing turned out, as predicted by the emperor. People did talk about him for years to come. The end. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that um, folktale story. It was the little boy who breaks the deception. So sometimes in old order to protect us and caution us from the inconvenience of the truth, we tend to resort to denial and we tend to resort, you know, and um, do away with evidence and uh, cultivate the lies and manufacture, you know, a story out of that. And this is what the emperor did. And just like Billy Jewel said, honesty is such a lonely word. Everyone is so untrue. I don't know if you know that song. Honesty is hardly ever heard. And mostly what I need from you. Honesty is 
very scarce because everybody is living a world of lies, dishonesty and falsehood and self-deception are ethically and morally wrong. It stems from pride, arrogance, self-sufficiency, thinking we don't need God, and with an overbearing attitude or methods, we refuse to get a hold of the truth and let God take over as we submit our mess before God, as we submit our insecurities and fear and failures and flaws before God. And if we, you know, are trying to cover it up, then the more that it becomes worse. And in number five, James chapter four, verse six, it says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So if we are serious in healing this broken nation, if we are serious in bringing healing to our culture, and if we are serious in bringing healing to our relationships and into our lives, then we need to humble ourselves and confess our sins. It's all about truth telling. It's all about not running away from the truth no matter how broken it is or no matter how fearsome it is it's about acknowledging the truth acknowledging the problem and not running away from it it's about honesty because people who cover up their sins will not succeed this is what the scripture says in number six and bob is putting that out proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 from niv version of the bible it says whoever conceals their sins does not prosper but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy thank you so revealing our sins and embracing our problems and owning up and taking responsibility of what went wrong in our lives in our job or in our work in our world is what restores relationships it what this is what brings healing this is when we find mercy when we are no longer scared of the truth and our humble admission is what releases the load from our soul and it is what brings healing to our mind body and spirit according to the Word of God and uh, James 5 16 and Bob is putting that up therefore the Lord said confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Thank you. We only change with the help of others. So we should not be afraid to confess and own up to the truth because it is when we confess and with the help of others that we can be restored back to healing and restore our well-being and that's when we find mercy for our lives and then we can move forward and start over again and learn the lessons of the past for our lives so if we are serious about getting uh, the nation healed, we need to confess our sins and turn to God. And this is what the United Methodist Church is doing 
with the United Methodist uh, Book of Discipline and in paragraph number five it says the UMC recognizes that the sin of racism has been destructive to its unity throughout its history racism continues to cause painful division and marginalization the UMC shall confront and seek to eliminate racism whether in organizations or in individuals in every facet of its life and in society at large the united methodist church or umc shall work collaboratively with others to address concerns that threaten the cause of racial justice at all times and in all places paragraph five of the book of discipline so friends i'm very happy that even our denomination is believing the truth telling or honesty and when we embrace the need to change our problems into better systems of becoming a church or transforming the way we interact with the world otherwise we just become clanging symbols just like what paul was saying we just become clanging symbols but we're not actually capturing but we're not actually living out the real challenges of being the light and salt of the earth to transform and better the world around us. So, Nathaniel's question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It is only when we confess, just like what we were saying a while ago, that we encounter the glory of God and confess and surrender and submit to God that we repent and get over the difficulties and the sins of our pasts and uh, eliminate the things that violate other people's lives and this is actually found in the general rules of our founder of the United Methodist Church John Wesley when he had the, he has this uh, general rules number one do no harm and number two do good and number three attend to all the ordinances of God so if we are committed to doing no harm and doing good and attending to the glory of God and encountering the praises and the worship of our Lord, we do not only wave the banner of Jesus' name, we do not only use and display the name of Jesus, but we actually live out the ethical, moral values of what it meant to follow Jesus Christ and to identify ourselves into the ministry and work and mission of our God. It is about standing up in behalf of the marginalized and the oppressed and the overlooked members of our society that we redress the human rights of others and build God's beloved community in the world around us. That is what comes out when we seriously consider healing our land and attending to the ordinances of God is we actually build God's beloved community because a nation is only good if it cares for its people a nation is only good if we are kind and loving to our neighbors and when we are actually a blessing to our local communities and
and to the world around us. And number nine, the calling of Jesus from the Gospel of John chapter 13 verses 34 to 35 as I have loved you Jesus said so you must love one another and by this everyone will know that you are my disciples thank you so can anything good come out of Nazareth friends this is what epiphany is all about it's about Nathaniel, you know, moving from being skeptical. Can it, really, can anything good happen if I follow Jesus? Into believing that, yes, this is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way because Jesus is love. Apart from love, apart from Jesus we can do nothing no one comes to the father except through love except through jesus except when we are one and in sync with the purpose and plan and priorities and the presence of god so that we can better the world and feel our vision with the glory of god especially during these hard days. So let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for calling us to your ministry and work. Thank you that we can respond to you today and renew our commitment to you. Help us, O oh God, to become signs and symbols of your power signs and symbols of your death and resurrection that we are called to become symbols of your healing and love and salvation for the world i pray you help and guide us oh god to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem of this nation that we can better this world and brighten up the nooks and corners where there is an outpouring of sadness, God help us to become instruments of your love, to become the body of Christ, to build the beloved community of God among us. And so today, O oh God, as we celebrate the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I pray, O oh God, that we will receive the light to brighten not only our world but the world around us as we commit ourselves to you and to your service so that we can give glory to your name and worship you in spirit and in truth thank you jesus for loving us thank you jesus for trusting us thank you jesus for blessing us in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen